Well, good evening. We're the Eugene Planning Commission, and tonight we will be holding a public hearing on an appeal of the hearings official's decision to approve the Benson zone change at 955 Coburg Road. And it's Z13-2. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm Bill Randall. I am the chair of the Planning Commission. I'm Jeff Mills. John Borofsky. Stephen Baker. Thank you. And um, before we um, begin, um, I need to go over the hearing procedures. And um, the decision of the Planning Commission on this appeal is quasi-judicial proceeding. So we'll be using quasi-judicial format for this public hearing in accordance with the applicable code requirements. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to receive relevant testimony on the appeal before us. We will not be making a decision on the appeal tonight. I want to remind everyone that your testimony must be directed toward the appeal issues and relevant criteria. Also, no new evidence pertaining to appeal issues can be accepted by the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission can only accept argument and analysis related to evidence that is already in the record. Those wishing to speak during the public hearing should have already submitted a completed request to speak for them. That's these green sheets here. Uh, if you haven't and you uh, wish to speak, please uh, take one of those. I think they're on the back table and uh, fill those out now and get those to staff and we'll uh, put you in the queue. Um, once the public hearing is opened, the speakers will be called in the following order. Those in support of the application, those with a neutral position, and those opposed to the application or in support of the appeal. The applicant and the appellant will each have 30 minutes to provide testimony. All others wishing to testify for any staff, or, excuse me, all others wishing to testify should limit their testimony to three minutes. At the end of testimony, we will ask for any staff response and then the applicant will have an opportunity for rebuttal. Next, I must remind everyone that the failure to raise an issue with sufficient specificity to allow the Planning Commission and parties to respond will preclude further appeal on that issue. Before we begin, the Eugene Code Section 9.7065 requires that Planning Commissioners disclose any conflicts of interest, ex parte contacts, or biases, abstentions, or challenges to impartiality. Do any commissioners have anything to disclose? No. no? Okay. Um, any, uh, let's see. Okay. Now, planning staff will provide a brief staff report uh, before we begin the testimony. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Zach Galloway, associate planner with the city of Eugene. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to walk through a few of the procedural items uh, that are before you this evening. Uh, make a quick summary of our staff report and uh, then discuss the 120 day timeline or time frame that we're working under. Um, first of all, a reminder, and I think uh, the Chairman Randall just mentioned that uh, advice to um, keep the appeal, state, uh, appeal pr procedure in your decision based on the appeal statement. Um, your charge in this appeal is to determine if the hearings official erred in his review uh, and should you base your decision on the facts. Um, before you in the official record. Um, regarding the official record, there's been some discussion of this, um, and Assistant City Attorney Ann Davies is here to address um, two is sp specific issues, um, taking official notice of a new piece of evidence, uh, and then specifically the Planning Commission's review role this evening. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, speak up, I guess. Or, okay. or were you able to hear to me when I was speaking? Could, could you hear Zach? Okay. okay. Oh, really? Okay. Can you hear me? No. Speak closer <laughs> to the microphone. <laughs> it's the best. We will try to okay. speak loud. Okay. I will try to speak loudly. Um, first, I want to address um, the pending motion to take official notice that was submitted into the record. Um, it was the official uh, request to take notice of an ordinance. Um, the city code allows you to take official notice of many different things, um, including ordinances. Um, the city attorney has given advice in previous matters c concerning kind of issues involved with taking official notice of certain facts. This is not one of those situations where you need to be concerned. So you have complete discretion in deciding whether you want to take official notice of what's been requested. Um, okay. 
<laughs> I am. My name is Ann Davies. I'm Assistant City Attorney. Um, so, are there any questions regarding the official notice piece? At what point should we make that motion? Um, I think we. I think it makes sense to have that done at the beginning of the proceedings. So, probably after staff gets done. Are you after the staff gets done with this presentation? Sure. Thank you. Uh, do you, you all have that motion? And have you all looked at that motion to take official notice? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll move on to um, the Planning Commission's review role. Um, this is this is a local appeal. The hearings officer has already made the initial decision in this, and an appeal was filed. So you are reviewing the hearings officer's decision. Uh, you're not making that the decision in the first instance, and that is it may become relevant in in your um, review of this decision. Um, so we've already mentioned you're not taking new evidence, um, and that's part of the review role. Is your the evidence is limited to what the hearings officer has has taken in previously. Um, you're reviewing the hearings officer's decision for error, and there's been some discussion around what that exactly means and whether that's accurate. The code, for your reference, when they're talking about the planning commission reviewing a hearings officer decision, says that if you're going to change it at all. You have to adopt findings um, as to why the hearings officer failed to properly evaluate the application or make a decision consistent with applicable criteria. So basically, they're saying you're supposed to be deciding whether the hearings officer erred. Um, and in explaining that you're not making that decision in the first instance, you're not putting yourself in the place of the hearings officer and saying, would I have made this decision differently? You're looking at the hearings officer's decision and deciding whether the hearings officer erred in making that decision in any way. So that's an explanation. If there's questions about that, please feel free to ask if it comes up. Um, but that's what your role is. Um, and the last piece around kind of your review role um, is a question that kind of came up in another letter, I think, from one of the opponents, is the burden of proof. I just want to make clear that the applicant has the burden of proof to demonstrate compliance with all the applicable criteria throughout the process. So at the hearings officer, the applicant had that burden. Tonight, the applicant still has that burden. But on an appeal, the appellant does have the burden to demonstrate that the hearings officer erred. And that's not shifting the burden in any inappropriate way. It's just explaining that the appellant, because they're appealing, does have a burden to demonstrate error on, on the part of the hearings officer. Okay. And that's all I have on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll move into a summary of our um, staff report and the issues um, therein. Um, staff analyzed the zone change and the applicant's request uh, for consistency with those four criteria that are outlined in your staff report or in your AIS. Um, we found that, uh, or we ultimately recommended uh, approval. Exactly. Excuse me. Get right into the. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> we found the applicant's uh, zone change uh, was consistent with the metro plan. The Willa Kinsey area plan uh, recommended that the hearings official um, adopt or, or approve the zone change request. Uh, that is all contained within the record. Uh, the hearings official decision, um, which is also within your record, um, concurred with the applicant's zone change request. Um, and that, of course, is why we're here um, to discuss the appeal. Um, of particular note, he did not apply the site review overlay um, due to what he viewed as a lack of legal authority. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about our position. But um, also, I wanted to bring up the 120-day timeline uh, that we're working with under at this time. Uh, the procedure, as you're probably aware, uh, or the, the application has to reach conclusion within 120 days. Uh, the applicant to this point has granted extensions totaling 37 days. Um, we have been to two public hearings before the hearings official. Uh, so at this point, we're kind of reaching the end of that 120-day uh, timeline. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're recommending that you come back for deliberations on July 22nd. Um, as the 120-day timeline wraps up on the 29th, which is the following Monday. Um, so that would give us some time on the 29th to continue uh, with deliberations if necessary or reach a final order. So just something to keep in mind uh, as you're moving forward after this public hearing. Uh, with that, 
brief summary. Uh, I will turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, for the uh, public hearing portion. Okay. Any questions of staff from the commission? And um, the motion, um, should we do do that mo address that it, motion it before we open the public hearing? Okay. So, chair would entertain a motion about um, receiving. Uh, I move to take notice of the official signed ordinance number 19855 and all accompanying exhibits and place these documents into the record for the Benson Zone Change Appeal File Z 13 2. Okay. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? I have one question. Since it appears that um, 19855 and 19856 are either companion measures or at least related, would it be prudent for us to also take official notice of 19856? I think the request was just for 19855. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor of taking official notice? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. And with that, I will now open the public hearing. And we will start with um, those in support of the application, which would, I believe, be the applicant to start with. So if the applicant uh, would come to the podium, and as you come to testify, if you would give your name and address, and we will try and speak into the microphones <laughs> clearly, and if you could too, um, and then uh, we'll start the timer. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Randall, Planning Commission. My name is Mike Reeder. I am uh, the attorney for the applicant, Ms. Benson. I'm at 800 Willamette Street, Suite 800, here in Eugene. Before I begin, before I begin, I'd like to uh, provide the Planning Commission and staff with some written written testimony that uh, will be uh, entered into the record. Yes, please. Thank you. It won't be necessary to follow, follow along. I just want to make sure that you have that, as I will refer to that on occasion. Thank you. So preliminarily, uh, I have no objection to uh, the Planning Commission taking official notice of uh, ordinance 19855. The ordinance 19856 is also found in the record, and I'll be referring to that that ordinance and its and its uh, exhibits and attachments. Uh, the second procedural issue uh, that I want to discuss that was discussed by your by your city attorney regards the burden of proof and the role of the planning commission in reviewing the hearings officials decision. I just want to make a note that I that I agree with the city attorney. However, as we move forward in this appeal process, should the planning commission agree with the the conclusions of the hearings official, it would be prudent for the planning commission to find in those findings of fact that uh, the planning commission is not providing or not granting any deference to the hearings official and to make that clear so that that issue is will not be an appealable issue at Luba and I, I say that because really I, I don't think it matters in this case this is such a clear-cut case that regardless of uh, the standard of your review or regardless of my burden of proof as the representative for the applicant uh, I believe that we we will be able to carry that burden of proof and you will be able to, to find independently that the hearings official made the correct decision so let's begin with the substance we have three ordinances that are that are uh, in question in this case and I'm just going to review them very quickly the first one we've already talked about which is or ordinance 19855 which was adopted by the Eugene City Council on June 8, 1992. And this is the ordinance that adopted what we call the WAP, or the Willikensee Area Plan. It's a refinement plan to the Metro Plan. Prior to the adoption of the WAP in 1992, uh, there was no refinement plan for this area or for the subject property. 
and the 1987 Metro Plan was the only planning document that regulated the subject property. And we'll discuss that uh, in a little, little bit later. Number two, the second ordinance is Ordinance 18, I'm sorry, 19856, also adopted January, uh, June 8th, 1992, as a companion to the Ordinance 19855. And this adopted the amendments to the Metro Plan that implemented the Willa Kenzie Area Plan. Because the Willa Kenzie Area Plan was a refinement to the Metro Plan, it was deemed necessary to uh, provide amendments to the Metro Plan uh, as part of that. And there is discussion of that in the record and um, also in my written statements that are in the record. The third ordinance is the ordinance that was highlighted by the hearings official and he did so correctly. This is Ordinance 20319, adopted April 21st, 2004. And this is the ordinance that adopted housekeeping amendments to the Metro Plan and that made the Metro Plan diagram parcel specific in certain instances. And the hearings official determined that the, this Metro Plan diagram that was adopted by this ordinance made this particular property parcel specific and designated the property MDR, medium density residential. The hearings official correctly concluded that, and we, we agree with the conclusions of the hearings official. We also agree with the majority of the, the reasoning of the hearings official, uh, and we would recommend to the Planning Commission, if the Planning Commission agrees with the conclusions of the hearings official, that the findings reflect some alternative uh, findings that further support those conclusions. And I will discuss what those are, and I would be available to assist uh, your city attorney in the drafting of those findings, should you find that necessary. Let me get to the meat of the, of the issues that were raised by the opponents. So the hearings official, agreeing with the city attorney and with the applicant, correctly determined that the Metro Plan diagram was parcel specific for the subject property and that the subject property was MDR. So in the hearings with the, plan, uh, with the hearings official, we, I, I showed uh, the hearings official, the 11 by 17 officially adopted and acknowledged Metro Plan diagram and it showed that the met that the sp the subject property was medium density residential and you could see low density residential on all four sides of the property and because of that the hearings official found that based on the language that was adopted in 2004 by the city council wherein the city council adopted four ways to find that a that a property could be parcel specific found in this instance that this property was parcel specific. The hearings official decision states that the plain reading of this new section of the Metro plan that was adopted by ordinance 20319 found on page 2G2 of the Metro plan states that it is where the Metro plan diagram is clear enough to determine the plan designation for an individual parcel then the Metro Plan diagram illustrates the City Council's intent for that parcel. Now this is important, and the hearings official got this right. What, when there's ambiguity in the meaning of an ordinance, and in this case we're talking about three ordinances, but in particular Ordinance 20319, the, the job of the, uh, of the review authority, in this case you, the Planning Commission, is to determine the intent of the lawmaking authority. And in this case, that was the city council back in 2004 and then, and then also back in, in 1992. So the, the, the way that you need to review this case is to look at what, what, the, what the city council's intent was. And when you look at the diagram, you find the, the 2004 Metro Plan diagram, the Metro Plan itself, the text of the Metro Plan says that when the diagram is parcel specific, it is showing the intent of the City Council to implement the policies and procedures of the Metro Plan. And so the city, the, the hearings official says the location and shape of the subject property, tax lot 101, the subject property, is easily recognizable in, a, in the official version of the Metro Plan diagram as being designated as medium density residential. A reasonable person viewing the Metro Plan diagram would conclude that the subject property is designated medium density residential. And that's what we argued to the hearings official in both of those hearings. 
in other words the city council's intent for the parcel was clear on the diagram and there's no room for interpretation as is in, as is common in other instances where the metro plan is fuzzy and not parcel specific the opposition this is important the opposition points to no new evidence or no evidence in the record and does not argue that ordinance 20319 is inconsistent with the, the, the metro plan diagram that was adopted as part of that ordinance in 2004 was inconsistent with the text of the ordinance merely the opposition argues that the mapping error in 1992 that we'll talk about was carried forward over time and that the error really occurred by planning staff when planning staff apparently miscolored the WAP in September 1992 in the copy that was not officially adopted the second issue the second primary issue that needs to be decided by the Planning Commission is whether or not the hearings official correctly determined that the Metro plan is the primary planning document at issue in this application and that he correctly focused on the intent of the City Council while the Metro plan diagram itself shows the intent of the City Council so does the so also does the legislative history for the adoption of ordinance 19856 as I said before when interpreting ambiguous ordinances it's the do, the duty of the decision maker to determine the intent of the lawmaker in this case the City Council so let's talk about ordinance 19856 this, this is the ordinance that adopted the amendments to the Metro plan that were that were shown to be consistent with the WAP also adopted the same day in 1992 the legislative history of ordinance 19856 was adopted concurrently with 19855 and it conclusively shows the intent of the City Council and that intent was and this is important is to retain the land use designation of the subject property as MDR and to not change to, to LDR now let me walk you through because there is so much information in the record let me walk you through the the pertinent legislative history that bears that out and you don't I, I don't believe it's necessary for you to turn to this but I want you to, to be aware that in the record in exhibit EE on page 119 on uh, 9991 there was a memo from planning uh, and public works staff to the Planning Commission and the subject was the draft Willikensee area plan policy issues and conflicts and this is what it said what what the planning memo said it said medium density to low density designation changes now I'm, I'm emphasizing a few words and I'll get back to why I'm emphasizing those during the development of the plans land use element it was determined that several areas which are designated for medium density residential development in the Metro plan have either been developed with low density single-family housing or the housing in those areas while not new was not likely to be redeveloped in the near future in those cases the planning team decided to seek a change from medium density to low dense to a low density residential designation in the metro plan so again the memo that was adopted that's legislative history for 19856 and also I would argue for 18 uh, I'm sorry 19855 indicates that planning staff was describing the changes actual changes from medium density residential for certain parcels to low density residential and this this determination was carried forward through the Planning Commission and through the City Council in the adoption of 18956 furthermore the legislative history bears this out it says in exhibit EE 134 attachment a of the same memo it says one the proposed changes from medium density to low density designations are a the area east of Coburg Road and north of Elysium and it cited 17 acres B the area east of Coburg Road between Harlow Road and Tandy turn that's where this subject property is seven acres and that's important seven acres <clears throat> then there's also an exhibit EE on page 178 there's a letter from dr. and mrs. William McCulloch who owned the subject property and this letter was dated August 1st 1991 and this is the letter that was submitted to the planning team that made recommendations to the Planning Commission 
they say, we are writing to request reconsideration of your proposed zoning. And what, what they meant was the proposed change of the Metro plan designation. The zoning change of our property at 955 Coburg Road with medium density to low density residential. The proposed low density classification would make our property one of only three such zone properties, etc. So the, all of the parties involved up to this point recognized that the planning team was recommending changes, okay, changes from medium density residential, what the metro plan designated, because remember there was no Willow Kenzie area plan, changes from medium density residential to low density residential. Exhibit NN, page eight, uh, there's an 11 12 91 meeting minutes of the Planning Commission that discusses precisely this issue. It says, number five, McCulloch request on Coburg Road. Remember, McCulloch owned the subject property. Mr. Lowe, who at that time was uh, Eugene Planning Staff, directed attention to the Metro Plan Amendment Area 5. Now, Metro Plan uh, Amendment Area number five was the area that we're talking about in question that included the subject property in the Willow Kenzie area plan. He said that the planning team did recommends, remember this is the planning team that worked so diligently for two years on the Willow Kenzie area plan. The planning team recommends to redesignate the area from medium density to low density residential. He said that the area contains a church and several properties zoned R1. Mr. McCulloch owns the northern par parcel and requests that his property remain medium density residential, citing the limited use for single family development. Mr. Lowe said that the planning team did not make a decision on that particular property. The group discussed, this is the planning commission, the group discussed, briefly discussed the surrounding uses. In response to a question from Mr. Van Landingham, a member of the planning commission at the time, Mr. Croteau said that the area is developed as low density residential now. Mr. Lowe said that Mr. McCulloch has expressed the intent to develop the property as medium density residential. Mr. Van Landingham moved and seconded, and it was seconded, to redesignate parcels within the Metro Plan area number five from medium density residential to low density residential. Another planning commissioner moved, seconded, and seconded to retain, this is important, to retain the medium density residential designation for the, Mr. McCulloch's property. The motion passed five to zero. Exhibit FF, the actual ordinance language itself of 19856 on page two says number five. Remember this is uh, the amendment number five. Change designation from medium density residential to low density res residential for six acres for a six acre site on the east side of Coburg Road between Harlow Road and Tandy Turn. Exhibit five, ordinance 19856, amendment five. You can see that in the record that was cited by the, by the hearings official, uh, adopted that. Now let me make something clear. It is true, it is true that going into this case, we were not aware, no party was aware, including Mr. Conte, was aware that the, the map for the, for the what we call the double WLUD, the Willard of the Willa Kenzie area plan that was an, um, that was an attachment to ordinance 19855. Nobody, nobody understood until Mr. Conti did some investigation, uh, some pretty good investigation with the city recorder's office. Nobody understood that the, that the WAP actually had a designation that was adopted um, as part of ordinance uh, 19855, that that was low density residential. Everybody had the, um, well, I don't have it with me, but the, the, the September 1992 copy of the WAP. So everyone under, everybody believed, assumed, that the WAP designated this property as medium density residential when really what happened, in my view, in looking at the, at the legislative history is Planning staff did not go back as directed and and uh, amend the draft Willow Kenzie area plan as part of the adoption of 19855. I'll admit that I have no reservations in admitting that. That's that's what appears to happen. That that was an error, but that error did not promulgate the intent of the city council. It contravened it. And hence, the, the, the case that is cited was cited by Mr. Conti originally when he thought that there was a mapping error 
Turner versus Jackson County applies in this case. And what that case talks about is what was the intent of the city council? It is clear that planning that the that city council and the planning commission rejected the planning team's original recommendation that this property be redesignated from medium density residential to low density residential and that it retain its current metro plan designation as medium density residential. And that's exactly what happened. And so eight, ordinance 19856 doesn't even refer to tax lot 101 because it was assumed that 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 the that was purposely omitted from the redesignation. There were other properties that were redesignated from medium density residential in that vicinity, but tax lot 101 was not. So the opposition has made a great deal about that fact that ordinance 19856 doesn't explicitly talk about tax lot 101. But that's because the work was done previously. The, the, the po ultimate policy choice was made earlier and was not, and, and I don't think it, it crossed anybody's uh, desk or was on anybody's radar that ordinance 19855 that adopted the WAP, nobody went back and changed the draft WAP. That's what should have happened, but it didn't happen. So your, your job as a, plan, as a review body of the hearings official is to determine the intent of the city council. Was the intent of the city council that this, this subject property retain its medium density residential designation or to change it? And I submit to you that the evidence is overwhelming that the intent, the, poli the ultimate policy choice of the city council was to maintain the medium density residential designation. That was, for, for whatever reason, for an obvious reason actually, was carried forward through the subsequent amendments to the Metro Plan Diagram. The latest being, th that's in the record, is the 2004 uh, housekeeping amendments that introduced a new Metro Plan Diagram that in some circumstances was parcel specific. So our position is this. I've, I've walked you through a pretty detailed legislative history. My position is this, that the hearings official got it right, that ordinance 20319 that was adopted in 2004, uh, that adopted our, the, the Metro Plan diagram that showed that this property was medium density residential and parcel specific, that that controls. That even if there is this conflict between the Metro Plan diagram and the, the officially adopted WAP uh, map, that the Metro Plan diagram controls over the WAP. The second question is, okay, well, what happens if you, uh, as will be argued by the, the opposition, as has been ar uh, argued by the opposition, that somehow the Metro, or that the Willikensee Area Plan diagram controls because the 2004 Metro Plan diagram carried forward a mapping error. I would submit to you that they, they have not shown that that was a mapping error in that direction. The mapping error was the other direction. When in 1992, planning staff failed to make the, the amendments to the 1992 draft, or I'm sorry, the 1991 draft of the WAP. And that's what should have happened. And so we both cite the Turner versus Jackson County and the Flying J, well, I, I cite the Flying J case for the proposition that the Planning Commission needs to look at the intent of, of the City Council. And you can look at the intent of the City Council either back in 2004 or back in 1992. Either way, you come to, you have the same result. And uh, I, that's the substance of, of our case. Um, there are, I, I could go through the brief history of this case, but I think you'll probably hear from it from the opponents, and so I'll reserve the rest of my comments for rebuttal. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Reeder. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Reeder? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Are there any others who wish to testify in support? I don't have any cards here. Okay, seeing none, uh, speakers with a neutral position are now invited. Okay, seeing none, uh, those speakers opposed to the application 
and uh, would call first the uh, appellant, I believe, um, to come testify and have, you also would have 30 minutes. Hello, my name is Jennifer Yeh. I'm the chair of the Harlow Neighbors. I live at 3739 Keeler Avenue. And uh, Carrie Richter and Paul Conte will be making our formal argument, but I have a short statement from the Neighborhood Association. Okay. I'd like to begin by reading the letter submitted on behalf of our executive committee. Dear Planning Commissioners, the Harlow Neighbors Executive Committee has considered the Benson Zone Change Decision Z13-2 for an up zone from R1 low density residential zone to R2 medium density residential zone of 955 Coburg Road. The Executive Committee finds that the hearings official erred in approving the zone change. Accordingly, the Executive Committee submits the attached appeal statement and requests that the Planning Commission reverse the decision of the hearings official which approved the zone change for the Benson property and deny the zone change on appeal for the lack of compliance with Eugene Code 9.8865 number 1 and 9.8865 number 2. I'd like to share a few additional comments. The Harlow Neighbors was recently recognized at the, na the Neighborhoods USA Conference in May as the grand prize winners of the National Neighborhood of the Year Award. Our neighborhood earned, earned this recognition for our strong community engagement in making our neighborhood a healthier, safer, and more vibrant place to live for residents of all ages and housecomes of all incomes. The specific program me recognized by NUSA was our Feed Hope program, which has so far produced and distributed 4,500 meals to children in our neighborhood who have limited access to day healthy daytime meals during school breaks. In addition to programs such as Feed Hope, the Executive Board recognizes that we have responsibilities that City C Council identified in Resolution Number 3746, which adopted a formal neighborhood organization recognition policy. One of the responsibilities we are charged with is Section 2E, which states, Neighborhood organizations shall continue the planning process by reevaluating the goals and objectives and recommendations contained within the neighborhood plan. We view the Willikensee area plan provisions as governing our actions, as well as those of the city with respect to land use. In this case, the Willikensee area plan has consistent and coherent policies and land use designations that were based on several years of citizen involvement in which City Council adopted unanimously on June 8, 1992. Council also adopted formal findings that our refinement plan was consistent with the Metro plan, and nothing has changed that fact. After reviewing the Willikensee area plan policies and the Willikensee land use diagram, which designates the Benson property as low density residential, the executive board determined that our refinement plan does not permit the Benson property to be rezoned to R2. We would invite the applicant to meet with the executive committee, if the applicant would like, to consider an amendment to the Willikensee area plan that would permit compatible development on their property in a way that will maintain the low density character of the established neighborhood. However, under the current comprehensive plan provisions, the city must deny the zone change. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Paul Haugen. My wife and our three sons live at 2773 Tomahawk Lane, and we've lived there for the last 18 years. Over the past four months, we've been coordinating neighbors who want to be informed and involved in the zone change decision uh, because of their concerns about the potential impact and un unrestricted R2 upzoning for the Benson property. When we first received the notice for the zone change back in March, I couldn't understand how that lot could be allowed uh, 28 apartments on it. It has been a single family residence for decades and is entirely surrounded by single family homes. One of my neighbors checked with the city planning division. He was told that there was no question that the lot was allowed to be upzoned according to the plan documents. At that point, several of us became very concerned. We called Jennifer Yeh. Uh, the Harlow Neighborhood Association chair. We had no idea where else to start. Jennifer 
then contacted Paul Conti, who looked over the application. Paul found that he believed it to be, uh, be a problem with the application. I asked him if he could help us, and he agreed to, to provide the neighbors with information that he had gathered. At that point, we organized a steering committee and distributed information about the zones, changed by emails, flyers, and by going door to door. Uh, during most of the process, we held our breath. Um, oh, excuse me. At that point, we uh, organized a steering committee and distributed information about the zone change. Um, as a result, 150 uh, neighbors signed a petition opposing the zone change after learning the potential impact. During most of the process, we held our breaths, wondering whether the city would take serious Paul's explanation about how the refinement plan map that colored the Benson lot as medium density residential refinement was clearly inconsistent with the re, uh, refinement policies that protected our areas. At the, at the end of April, Paul informed us that he found the original copy of the refinement plan diagram that the city council had adopted. And this map colored the low density residential area. There was a proof, uh, there was proof that the lot was not supposed to be converted from single family to dense apartments. Our hopes shot up and we were confident the zone change would be denied. So you can imagine how the hearings official decision hit our neighbors and hit us. How could a city official actually say it could be imprudent to ever consider our refinement plan policies and to uh, correct map designations of the Benson lot? We have been given clear and convincing advice from the attorneys who have worked on this case that our refinement plan is consistent with the Metro plan and that the lot is designated as low density residential. Mr. Reeder himself told the hearing officials, quote, if the refinement plan land use designation map couldn't be used to determine the Benson property de designation, then what is the map's purpose? My neighbors and I thought once the facts were all known, all would be done. We believe the hearing official was confused by Mr. Reeder, but please don't let me con contort the rules in ways that serve my, uh, but please don't let him contort the rules in ways that serve only the applicant's interest. We deserve a decision that respects the refinement plan and that applies the laws in the proper way. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Good evening, Chair Randall and Commissioners. This is Terry Richter. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I, I, I am a land use attorney at the firm Garvey Schubert Bear in Portland. I'm here today representing Paul Conti. I want to thank you for allowing me to participate by telephone. For most of the time, this zone change application was before the hearings official. The applicant and her attorney, Mr. Reeder, as well as the city planning staff and the hearings official believed that the Willikensee area plan designated the subject property as medium density residential, or MDR. The applicant's attorney has admitted as much this afternoon. When Mr. Conti was asked by concerned neighbors to review the zone change application, he recognized that two Willikensee area plan policies appeared to be in direct conflict with the NB N MDR designation shown on the Willikensee land use diagram that is part of the Willikensee area plan. Residential policy one requires the city to maintain the existing low density residential character of existing neighborhoods a clearly prescriptive policy that would apply to the subject property and with which a change to a medium density zone would obviously conflict. Policy 4 for the Harlow sub-area, which encompasses the subject property, is even more explicit and requires that the city shall consider the subject property as appropriate only for low density residential uses. The applicant's attorney made no mention of these policies this evening. Early in the process, on March 26th, Mr. Conti advised the planning staff by email that the applicant's consultant had been apparently confused by an incorrectly colored version of the Willikensee land use diagram, but staff and the applicant ignored this advisory. We know now Mr. Conti was right. Through his efforts, the correct Willikensee land use diagram has been retrieved from the city recorder's office, and that plan diagram clearly shows that the city council designated the subject property as low-density residential consistent with the written policies of the Willikensee area plan that the council adopted at that same time. Unfortunately, the true and correct designation 
<clears throat> of the subject property was proven only after two public hearings and reams of testimony had already occurred. By his own words, the hearings official was, quote, bewildered by all the discussion concerning the history and adoption of the Willikensee Area Plan in 1992. We think this is likely the result of the timing by which this came to light, um, and the result of this is that the hearings official committed a series of errors, including concluding that it would be, quote, imprudent to set forth any findings responding to Mr. Conti's extensive theory that the subject property was incorrectly mapped in the 1992 Willikensee Area Plan adoption. This is on page 13 of the decision. This is the, the, this is the error. This is the fulcrum of the error. And even the applicant tonight says that there are errors in the hearings officer's decision and uh, I believe would say that this is one of them, that you're going to have to make findings as they relate to uh, the Willikensee Area Plan adoption in 1992. Without further ex examination, the hearings of official then restate, rested his entire analysis on the following de demonstratively tubly, erroneous finding. Quote, the origin of the subject property's designation in the metro diagram is ordinance number 19856 which amended the Metro Plan Diagram to specifically designate the subject property medium density residential, end quote. And that's what the applicant has been talking about to, to, tonight. Um, I think you, if you uh, look at the materials that are before you, you'll find that Ordinance Number 19856 has no such amendment to the Metro Plan, either stated or implied. Rather, the hearings official and as summarized by the applicant tonight, relies entirely on the record before the planning commission and states that in the case of ambiguity, you have to look at the legislative history to tease out what the applicable zone is. There is no ambiguity in this case. There is no evidence of changing the plan designation or the plan policies that I quoted either earlier. In considering the role of legislative history, the Oregon Supreme Court has explained there is no more persuasive evidence of the intent of the legislature than the words by which the legislature undertook to give expression to its wishes. Although legislative history can help to confirm the meaning of text, only the text of the ordinance that received the consideration and approval of a majority of the city council is required to give effect to the law. Therefore, although the Planning Commission is certainly free in this case to consider legislative history, they are also required to give it the evaluative weight it deserves. And with all due respect to the hearings official, ambiguous notes contained in the record of deliberations before the Planning Commission during a legislative proceeding are insufficient to be accorded the effect of law. Therefore, a key fact with regard to ordinance number 19856 is that it had no effect at all on the subject property land use designations. And the commissioner should ignore any attempt by the applicant's attorney to spin the ordinance another way. The most important key fact is that Ordinance Number 19855, which the Council adopted minutes before Ordinance Number 19856, adopted the Willikensee Area Plan, including the Willikensee Land Use Diagram and the policies I mentioned earlier. And in this ordinance, the Council explicitly adopted findings that the plan policies and land use diagrams were consistent with the Metro Plan. The Willikensee Area Plan's consistency with the Metro Plan, including the policies and land use designation of the subject property, were acknowledged by LCDC in 1992 and were never challenged. The third key fact in this case is that Ordinance Number 20319, which is where the applicant started their summary of the facts, this evening, which adopted the 2004 Metro Plan update, is similarly unambiguous. It did not amend the land use designation that the subject property had prior to the ordinance. 
The hearing's official decision found on page 13 that, quote, the subject the subsequent wholesale replacement of the Metro plan diagram in 2004 retained the status of the subject property. Thus, ordinance number 20319, which I'll reiterate, was a housekeeping determination where um, designations were changed based, based on parcel specific determinations and, were not, and no discussion of tax lot 101 came up. Under ordinance number 20319, the property retained the true and correct designation of low density residential. And therefore, the current designation of the subject property is still low density residential. And based on that evidence, the Planning Commission must deny this zone change. Thank you. At this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions now or later. Thank you. Are there any questions from the Commission? No. Okay. No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Helen Worthington. Okay. Hi. Hi. Good evening. My name is Helen Worthington, and I live at... Can you, you can usually hear me without the microphone. If you could tip, tip the microphone down just a bit. There? there go. That, that, that's good. Speak, speak closely into the microphone. Okay. If I do this, Zach has to do it too. <laughs> we'll work on him. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Helen Worthington, and I live at 2772 Tandy Turn. After my husband passed away 12 years ago, um, my family, my children and I decided I needed to move into town from our home and acreage in the Mohawk Valley where we had lived for 43 years. I looked a long time to find a special home that would fit my needs and was affordable. I was looking for a stable neighborhood of older homes with well-kept yards and close to shopping and stores and my son lived in the Coburg area on Oakmont. When I found my current home, I knew it was right for me. And I have loved, li <clears throat> excuse me, loved living there in this wonderful neighborhood. My small backyard shares a fence with the Benson property, which has for many years has lots of trees and beautiful roadies. The privacy of the trees afforded me by the Benson property were an important reason I was okay with moving into a home, buying a home close to the busy Coburg Road. I'm anxious if this zone change is approved. Several of the adjacent property owners and myself met with Mrs. Benson and her attorney to see if we could work out a way for her to be able to develop some additional housing on her property but still protect the neighborhood character that is so important to her, her neighbors and myself. Point of order, Mr. Chair, th this is testimony outside of the record. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, please, please limit your testimony. I'll encourage everyone to please limit their testimony. Okay, to so I didn't need to say, I couldn't say in, that. What's in the record is, is the only things we can consider okay, thanks. here tonight. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I learned, you have to give it to my age. I learned from one of the attorneys that an R2 zone allows buildings that could have a height of 35 feet and only five feet from my property line of my backyard. If that happens, I lose all privacy in my backyard and the sun would be entirely blocked out at, uh, during much of the year. I was also told that most of the trees and landscaping would be removed and a large area of the lot would be used for parking cars and comings and goings. I want to ask what would happen to my livability in my home? This home represents a substantial portion of my remaining at this home represents a substantial proportion of my remaining acts assets, excuse me. 
I am 77 years young. <laughs> and should I ever need to move into to an assisted living facilities, I will have to sell my home. What do you think is going to happen to the value of my home when a large apartment and parking lot is within a few feet instead of single family home homes? I don't know the ins and outs of all of your city regulations. I know you have to follow those. I just want you to know this: if this zone change is approved, it will have a terrible impact on my life, both financially and losing livability to what I hoped was going to be a beautiful neighborhood in which I could live my years out. I'm asking you do not approve this zone change, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Worthington. Next, I believe, is Don Merle. Myrle? Am I saying that right? Murray. 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 Good evening. My name is Don Murray. My wife, Colleen, and I moved here from Montana in 1969 so that I might complete my graduate degree at the University of Oregon. We've lived at 2790 Furwood Way since 1985, and our property is adjacent and directly east of the Benson property. And like Helen, who just spoke, the character of this established area is defined in a large part by the sense of privacy and nature in the backyards that we all have. The Benson lot is surrounded by nine single family lots. And so it's more than just one lot neighboring another lot. I, I think of the, when I saw the first map of our area, I, I thought of the Benson property as like a keystone holding up an arch. And at the very pinnacle, there's one key, keystone, and I see that property uh, as the key to the future of that neighborhood. This is why we cannot afford to lose the Benson's current compatibility with all of our homes. To do so would to disrupt and destabilize the existing neighborhood and its residential character. I want the commissioners to know that we and many of our neighbors would not oppose additional housing on the Benson lot and we have that opinion expressed, and I think it's a matter of record. We think that the Willa Kenzie area plan is very clear. Regardless of the specific density designation of the Benson property, residential policy one in the refinement plan is a mandatory approval criterion that requires maintaining the low density residential character of this established neighborhood, including the Benson lot. Policy four under the Harlow subreg area is also a mandatory approval criterion that limits development on the lot to low density residential. As I understand these regulations, this zone change can't be approved unless there are sufficient conditions of approval that ensure that those two refinement plans are met and their policies are met. Unrestricted R2 development would conflict with these policies. As a starting point, if the zone change were to be approved, the density should be limited to no more than 14 dwelling units per area, per acre, which is the upper limit for Eugene's low density residential zone, and well above the 10 dwelling units per acre minimum for the medium density residential zone. In addition, any triplex, fourplex, or multiple family development should require approval of a planned unit development consistent with the allowed uses for the low density residential zone. Requiring approval for a PUD that is consistent with those two Willikinsey area plans is that I reference would be the only practical and effective way to comply with the approval criteria. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next I have Barbara Stouffer. Okay. 
Good evening. <clears throat> now, I have a soft voice, but I'll give this a try, huh? <laughs> My name's Barbara Steffler. Sorry. That's I okay. mispronounced it. I answered anything. My husband, Walt, and I built our home at 2859 Tandy Turn, East Sand Tandy Turn, 48 years ago when we were very young. <clears throat> when the property now owned by the Benson family was just the home, a stable, and a field for their horses. Some days, our eight and a half and seven-year-old boys and I would walk up the street to visit and pet those horses. Our street felt like a rural setting. The neighborhood was a quiet, peaceful, and safe place to live. We've all accepted the many changes that have come about in those 48 years. There's less open space and more houses, but those houses are home to many great neighbors that we enjoy. All in all, quality of life is still good, and the low density character is still highly valued by the folks who live here. There aren't horses on the Benson property these days, but the property is still a key element in the neighborhood's character. All that would change, all of that would change immensely if the requested zone change is approved. The requested R2 zone would allow dense apartment development with buildings up to 42 feet high, five feet from our backyards. The large buildings and required surface parking that will be required will mean the removal of mature trees and landscaping and loss of much open space. <clears throat> Noise and bright lights from the tenants and on-site car traffic would impact the livability of our quiet property night and day. City staff have claimed a site review overlay zone would address concerns, but from what I've learned, the site review wouldn't actually do anything meaningful to prevent the significant de degradation of the existing character of the Benson lot and all the homes around it. Over the past several months, my neighbors and I have come to know about the Will Willikensee area plan which was developed by an extensive community effort over a three-year period. I was reassured from my own reading and from what the attorney we hired and Mr. Conti told us that the plan has a very specific land use designation and explicit policies to maintain the existing low density character and to ensure that the city continues to consider the Benson property and all the surrounding properties as appropriate only for low density residential use. But the hearing official completely ignored the Willikinsey area plan and approved the, law, the zone change. All of the neighbors along with the Neighborhood Association Executive Board have come together on this threat to our neighborhood and homes. So at this time, I'd like to ask everyone present who opposes the zone change to quietly stand. Thank you. Please respect our community and respect our refi refinement plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have um, John Young as part of the 30-minute aspect, and you have about a minute and a half left. So, okay. Good evening. My name is John Young. My wife, Brittany, and I live at 2798 Furwood Way uh, with our two young kids, uh, Morgan, three, and Kellen, five months. Um, I've helped Jennifer Haugen coordinate the neighbor's engagement since the beginning of this process, and during that time I've read all of the letters from the applicant's attorney and all of the materials. Frankly, I've, I've been a little bit surprised at how disrespectful uh, Mr. Reeder has been toward the efforts by Mr. Conti and his attorney to get the correct facts out. When Mr. Conti submitted the initial evidence that strongly suggested the Willikensee land use diagram relied upon by staff was miscolored, Mr. Reeder wrote the hearings official that Mr. Conti's testimony was, quote, 
a labyrinth of fanciful assumptions, fantastic speculation, and false conclusions. That's, that's unnecessary. Yet it turns out Mr. Conti was absolutely correct, and he delivered the original ordinance to prove it beyond a doubt. On April 14th, the applicant's attorney wrote to Mr. Galloway, There is no doubt the WAP land use diagram and maps are to be used to identify the metro plan designations of specific lots and parcels, including the subject property. If the WAP land use designation maps cannot be used to determine the subject's property desi designation, then what is their purpose? To ask the question answers it, it is obvious that the purpose of the WAP land use designation maps are meant to provide parcel specific land use designations. But what does the applicant's attorney say now that we know for certain the WAP designates the Benson property as low density residential? Mr. Young, that that was the timer for the 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. I, I have two more people that didn't make it into that 30 minute time slot and I'm trying to think how best well, to not... yes right right I, I haven't finished my question yet thank you was curious as to how we should do that I'll look at the city attorney if that if those two can have the three minutes it, or it's your discretion how you want to deal I'm, with that situation how would you I move to uh, allow them to have the th have three minutes of this no objection yeah that, that would be my thought so we'll we'll now start the three minute cycle and I have uh, Dick Hansen next I'll read fast. My name is Dick Hansen. And my wife and I, uh, Pat, live at 2744 Tomahawk Lane, and we've been there since 1971. I'll just get through. I was on the uh, planning committee with the uh, with uh, a couple of people you know, uh, Randy uh, Randy Hellick and uh, uh, excuse me, Randy Luddick and uh, um, E-Web Commissioner John Brown. So three of us. Uh, Worked, and I think all three of us were probably uh, from the business side and not from the community side. But I, I just I left my testimony here. But there's no question that the people that formed that committee had one main thing in mind, and that was to maintain the single family home residential uh, areas as they're developed. And there's no question that we, as that committee, knew that that we did not want to keep infringing on uh, single-family homes to the detriment of the existing homes. So that uh, Benson property was sing certainly a single-family designation, and we recognized that we had the apartments that are already there, and, and we recognized that they had to stay that way. But we also, as a community, as the members of that community that lived in there, said we don't want to infringe on our livability and we want this plan to be so that we are not being subject to that kind of a, of a change so uh, I, I think that there's no question what whatever the staff may have said uh, mr. L uh, Lowe we didn't approve that kind of a change our committee would have said no if we'd been given a vote on it thank you thank you mr. Henson uh, next I have Paul Conti Start. Um, my understanding from staff was that both sides would have 30 minutes for their formal presentations and three minutes for any independent speakers. Uh, wasn't that the understanding that I got? Yes. Yes. Uh, and Jennifer Ye pointed out that uh, Ms. Richter and I would share the formal presentation. Ms. Richter used eight minutes, so I would like to have um, at least 12 minutes. Mr. Reeder used 20 minutes, so we would be on parity then. Um. I mean, either, what, what would be the point? We've really held people down to not talk long. We've kept people from testifying at length. This is just Mr. Reeder had 20 minutes for formal presentation. They could have had as many people as they wanted at three minutes. We should get at least 20 minutes for our formal presentation. You've 
currently have 30 minutes for your formal presentation. Uh, we have, uh, Ms. Jay said at the beginning that the formal presentation by appellant would be done by Ms. Richter and myself. That's in the, in the, in the record. Okay, that, that wasn't the way it was presented here, so. It, it I, was, that was what she uh, said. Staff, is that what she said? Yes. That we started the clock. Yeah, we did, we did start the clock, so. What's the commission's uh, feeling? Well, it was represent. At least my my view was it was represented that there was a, a packet that would be the thirty minutes, and that's what those, these last people that we were were coming up. Who, who represented that? When when we were given the stack of green. Uh, the one through nine. No, but I uh, I spoke with both Mr. Flock and Mr. Galloway and said, could we have fifty minutes because that would be the equivalent of the thirty minutes presentation plus less than three minutes per speaker there was no mention of 30 minutes but now we're willing to pull back but you've got to let us have up to 20 minutes that mr. reader had to do the formal presentation well mr. Conti what what we gave to both the appellant and the applicant beforehand was that you would each have 30 minutes for your presentations and that that fairness is a way to you know Keep, keep things equal in those presentations and Mr. Reeder chose to use his time as 20 minutes and not have other people you and your group chose to have your time and you've, you've used up the 30 minutes we've allowed the last two speakers you being one of those to go ahead and go into that three minute cycle with the others that are also here to testify against and so I'm, I guess I'm just concerned of fairness to both sides to well, have like have said, initially we enough have enough time. I'm not, I'm not going to weigh in on this. On this. I mean, the Mr. Conte had over an hour at the hearings official. That's that's not neither here nor there. Yeah. Staff Thank represented to us, and we played by the rules. That's all I'm saying. <coughs> I don't know what it certainly wasn't stated at the beginning of this that there would be 30 minutes. Actually, it was. I, I stated at the beginning that the applicant and the appellant would each have 30 minutes, Before and the then. Their for their presentation, presentation for their presentation and and, their and it was well, it was represented to us that this was your formal presentation I didn't represent that and this is this is characteristic of what happens here I don't know okay Mr. Uh, Mr. Conte, I'm, I'm going to suggest Conte. the Planning Commission just make the you know, deliberate among yeah. yourselves we'll, we'll Mr. Conti if you could sit down we'll deliberate among ourselves and we'll make the decision okay. I I just have a question for staff um, when you put together the packet how did you how was that determined that you said that it was said that this would be the, the part of the 30 minutes the names the one through nine slips were presented to us as a as a packet so we I, I understood that the speakers would follow in that order they're numbered I mean you can you can see there that the mm -hmm. the nine slips are numbered one through nine what's your thoughts my understanding uh, was when uh, Gabe brought the uh, packets out to us, we knew that they totaled 54 minutes, and they were asking for 54 minutes, and I believe Bill and I were the only commissioners present. We said, no, we're going to count the first 30 as their 30, and then we're going to go through three minutes apiece, and that that was the fair way to proceed. Yes, and, and as, as I recall, the, the concern that I had at that time was that... Um, at the last minute, finding out 54 minutes was requested that the uh, uh, applicant uh, wouldn't have had that opportunity to prepare testimony of a similar length should they desire to do that. Um, just to clarify, um, Speak in the mic. just to clarify, in the past we've given the applicant and the appellant 30 minutes and then as many other people wanted to testify right. got three minutes right so you're saying if you did the math you got 54 minutes 30 minutes plus the three no minutes. what what I'm saying is before the meeting right before the meeting there was a request made for 54 minutes from um, mr. Conti for their presentation and at that time our concern was we had already put out 30 minutes to both sides as their formal presentations and that that would put the applicant at an undue disadvantage of not being able to prepare an additional 24 minutes of testimony should they desire to do that and that was that was kind of the concern that came up then in just in the interest of fairness 
um, made the determination that it would be 30 minutes and we would stay with that because of the late late hour request had that request come a week ago or, or whatever we could have had time to review that with both sides no I know but again my question is if you multiply the number of speakers who are against for times three minutes and there's then nine times three would be 27 minutes and then plus the 30 minutes would be 57 minutes potentially yes again but that's my normally uh, again I, it seems like things were got uh, I'm not really comfortable with the, you know with what with what happened we sh should have made it clear that you know there's 30 minutes and each person gets three minutes there's one you know one or two people that are part of the actually we we have made that clear that there's 30 minutes for the formal presentation and they can use that however they want if that's one person or two people um, traditionally there have been times where those, that's been shared and it's been very clear that that's the formal presentation that that's the 30 minutes additionally people who want to speak can speak and they each have three minutes and because we've made it through seven I determined that at least eight and nine could at least have their three minutes rather than be excluded completely okay, again, that would be my thought again my concern would be there was some testimony early on it was clearly uh, it clearly seemed like it was part of the three uh, you know the the, the official uh, mm -hmm. appealing testimony and then there were then there, then there was testimony that felt more like community members voicing their opinion and to count that toward the 30 minutes seems a little awkward to me we weren't the ones that made that choice <laughs> I guess it'd be my thought I, I, I think my feeling on it is similar to Commissioner Baker's I, I mean in my view Jennifer Yeh Paul Haugen the attorney calling him by the phone seemed to me to be definitely people that were you know part of the 30 minute in my this is again this is just the way it felt to me some of the other neighbors that came up and testified felt more like they should have signed up into the three minute one that being said again this is a this is a case that has had very a lot of idiosyncrasies as far as things like that so I would tend to lean towards leniency as far as as the testimony of Mr. Conte, the amount of time I I would be willing to to dis, to discuss, but I would be lean, lean towards a little bit extra time for him. Okay. Yeah, I was going. I would not. You would not. I was going to suggest the same thing. Some some maybe not twelve minutes, but maybe six minutes or something that would you know we could live with, and that would cover some. Of the, you know, one of the speakers was cut off after a minute and a half. And it seemed like that was one of the three minutes. I, I never realized that was part of the presentation. Okay. I think we have a split commission uh, because I'm inclined to not also extend the time. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking at the city attorney. What a tie vote! Then, then it would does. Then it would then not it, pass. Then it would not pass. Yeah, well, yeah, you'd probably go back to what you originally announced, yeah. which if that's clear. I think it was 30 minutes on each side. So okay, so well let's let's actually take a formal vote. All those in favor of extending the time that Mr. Conti's requested say aye, 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 and those opposed say nay, nay, nay. Okay, motion ties. So Mr. Conti, three minutes. Well, I just hope you give better attention to the written testimony than you do to hearing people actually speak in a public forum. I think that's really a pretty poor example, and I'm happy. And Mr. Conti, if you could keep your comments on. civil, we would appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. And I, I think I was. <clears throat> I want to point out that uh, Mr. Reeder's uh, attempt to rewrite history on Ordinance 19855 is specifically a collateral attack which is illegal. You cannot go back and attack an ordinance that has been approved, was not challenged, and was acknowledged. So any speculation that he has about the fact that Ordinance 19855 might have been a mistake is not valid at this point. That should have been raised within the period that was allowed for objection to that ordinance. Second, Mr. Reeder has spun nothing but Planning Commission records 
to try and attribute to the city council intentional action. Within minutes, the council adopted an ordinance that had explicit map in front of them with the designation of that parcel. It had explicit policies that reinforced that map, and it had an explicit finding that said this ordinance was consistent, and the map was consistent, and the policies were consistent with the Metro plan. Those uh, uh, policies, map, and findings were acknowledged by LCDC. There is no question that that outweighs bringing in planning commission notes, no matter how many inches you stack up of it, that does not determine council's intent. If you read the ordinance 19856, and I encourage you to read every line of it, there is not a shred of a finding about the uh, tax lot 101's designation. If council had intended that, they would have put it in a finding. There is not a shred of action to amend it. The hearings official stated that ordinance 19856 amended the Metro plan, he was wrong. Second is Ordinance 19856 was never effective. It did not comply, and read the, read the testimony, it did not comply with the condition in the ordinance itself that Lane County adopt an ordinance of identical amendments. I have submitted the reordered pages in the correct order of that Lane County ordinance. There is nowhere in there that Amendment 5 is completed by specifying the new designation of the subject lots. Ordinance 19856 was never, never became effective. That's not a collateral attack. That's simply what is in the ordinance itself. Its condition to become effective was never met. Ordinance 20319, the hearings official himself got it right. It's absurd to think that when you adopt a new map that has to be replacing an old map because of the technology and the way you draw it, that somehow that enshrines an error. The LUBA has held on this, and if you rule in, in Mr. Reader's favor on that, you'll get it back in your laps, I can assure you. Furthermore, if you look at the legislative history there in the notes from Elcock, and if staff would hold up the map there, and uh, the clock this against staff time, I've got about five seconds as I understand it. If you can hold it up so that they can see it, I can make my point in five seconds. I think you know which page I'm referring to, right? <clears throat> I'm going to walk up so I can make sure. Thank you, Mr. Conti. Excuse me, before you go to the rebuttal, this is Carrie Richter. Uh, Ms. Ms. Richter, we're not at the rebuttal yet. We are have you concluded the applicant's present or the appellant's presentation? We n we have concluded the formal presentation. We are now proceeding into those who wish to testify from either the neighborhood or concerned citizens against the measure. They will each get three minutes. But, but I'd like to point out two quick things procedurally, if I may. First of all, the individuals who testified earlier before Mr. Conti did not represent the neighborhood and they did not state that they represented the neighborhood. It was it's not clear to me how they can be part of the appellant's presentation. Secondly, Ms. Victor, what, what was given to us was that those testimonies were listed in order and numbered and requested to be as that initial 30-minute presentation. What, what, you know, what, what the thought was that that was how it was presented to us. But those individuals never stated that they were representing the appellant in any way as a neighborhood. I'm not sure how you can interpret that to be the case. This is Ann Davies, the city attorney. I think when the announcement was made at the beginning of the hearing, it was determined that the applicant would get 30 minutes and anyone opposed would get 30 minutes. So it doesn't seem relevant whether they were part of the neighborhood group or, or what they were. And, and furthermore... Traditionally, we have allowed both applicant and appellants in their formal presentation that is in that 30 minutes, which is our typical time limit, 
to arrange that with any people that they want to to make their case and that was how it was presented to us I think the planning commission has made a decision on that at this point so I just want to make state the error for the record I also want to note that I believe that the applicant has submitted some new material into the record that I haven't seen and if it is, does contain any new evidence I request the right to rebut it pursuant to 197-7636-D. I'll weigh in. This is Ann Davies again. Um, I do have a copy of what just got submitted by the applicant. I haven't looked through it, so I don't know if it has new evidence in it. Um, I, I assume that it mostly has argument. So what we'll have to do is look at that and determine whether there's new evidence and then let you know okay. so we can let her know whether she has an opportunity to rebut. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. The next person I have is Dean, is it Hale? Or halt. My name is Dean Hale. I live on 2811 Tandy Turn. Paul, if you need more time, I would be happy to surrender my time to you. I want to speak about quality of life, and I also like to talk. I'm not an attorney, but I like to talk about due process. The notice to residents was indecipherable of the original planning. Um, it could not be readable. The maps were not re readable. I could not determine from the maps what properties were impacted. That's not okay. I went online. I checked for it. What was online was not good. I consider that a defect in notice. Um, quality of life. Changing this from R1 to R2 and 28 to 34, 31 apartments is incongruent with the neighborhood. We can just look up the street at some other development which is horrible. It looks like a commercial establishment rather than residency. It will change permanently the character of the neighborhoods. Frankly, too, I am shocked that you would be wanting to cut off communications. There are a group of people here that need to speak and need to be heard. I'm shocked about the truncating of the public process. You could increase the amount of time. This is a civic issue. You need to be open to the public. Um, units of this size and numbers, there will be increased parking problems. This will mean overflow onto Tandy Turn, Already the church has overflow parking on there. That will create problems. Um, also, I would say if this does go through, that there not be a conditional use permit permitting some altercations so that there would not have to be so many required parking spaces. I've seen this happen elsewhere, and it's a mess. Um, I also need to speak to the character of the property. It has had violations in the past. There have been sign or, uh, business signs there. The Planning Commission, the uh, Building and Permits Office, had to enforce that. Also, I am now seeing a lot of industrial vehicles parked there. That does not look and feel like residence to me. When we have these kinds of violations, it's hard to trust. The five-foot setback, that's horrible. For uh, 34 to 45 feet, and losing of light, what about solar power? What about the requirements there? This is horrible for neighbors. Also, one of the neighbors is trying to sell. There was a talk with a real estate agent. The real estate agent did not disclose that this property is under uh, discussion for rezoning. That's an ethics violation at the very least. So I would recommend that, OK, we want to help people. We want to support our neighbors. But 28, 34, 31 apartments, that's too much. As one previous speaker spoke, OK, make it unrestricted R2 to 14 units uh, per acre. That would be a lot more reasonable. Make it a PUD. Make it a Mallory Lane. That would be more consistent with the flavor of the neighborhood. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hale. I have Tony Zeckenmeyer. My name is Tony Zeckenmeyer. We live at 2732 Tandy Turn, and we border the north side of the Benson property. We moved there in November 25 years ago, and at that time, my husband and I, we were a newlywed couple with a five-year-old son. It was a quiet neighborhood with good neighbors. At the time, the property in question was owned by Bill and Jane McCulloch, 
and they had a home with an apartment at the end of the home that was always rented to a senior citizen. They had a beautiful pool in the back, a pool house, manicured lawns, and Bill grew and donated one of a kind, rhod rhododendrons and azaleas and other plants which he grew and either donated or sold to the community and organizations. Many of these are evident around Lane County today. Both the Sheltons next door and us were allowed to use their pool at our discretion. And as long as there was a parent pres present, they were good with it. To this day, I think this opportunity fostered both of our kids into the water polo uh, life. When Jane passed away, Bill came to us and advised he may be applying for a change in zoning. And he had someone interested in buying that property who wanted to have an in-home business. He wanted to let us know because he didn't want us to catch us unaware knowing that there would be a rezoning. Then he came back to us and said that that didn't go through and there would be no changes. It would stay single family dwelling as long as he had it. So whatever you just told us, not necessarily the truth as far as I can see. Bill was always good with what he said. Is this evidence in the record? It's evidence to what you just said. So I'm going to have to object to that because I have no, no knowledge of what you're talking about. If it's in the record, fine. If it's not, then I have to be stricken. I can't so, that's not so yeah. One, once, once again, I'll have to ask. Are okay. we? We are legally bound to only okay. consider well, he, evidence. Okay. Well, he was saying what record. happened with the county and what he believed happened. It's not what did happen. What he believed happened. I'm telling you that this is what I know, and that's what I'm saying. So, if you want to strike it, that's your choice. But that is something that happened with us. Okay. okay. Through the years, with new businesses and the increase of low income and regular income housing projects along Coburg Road, it has increased 100 times the amount of traffic and congestion that we had initially when we first moved to this area. The new owners have filled in the pool, turned the pool house into multi housing, and new owners and the yard has also now housed approximately three businesses. This is a property that is considered low density. Uh, within a half mile either direction is 10 rental properties. Of those 10 rental properties, we have uh, signs out in front that say for rent and vacancy. So I guess I just don't get why we are subjecting ourselves to more traffic, more disruption of pro privacy to the multiple families who have been in these homes for years to add another multi-unit housing complex which will benefit only two people, the city of Eugene and the person that is there on that site. Is there really a current need for more apartments on Coburg Road. Instead, the city should be looking at the benefit for those two entities and turn the application around maybe and say, what will this benefit our community? Okay, thank you. We moved to this, I'm just about done. I just have one sentence. Okay. We moved to this area because it was a quiet residential area close to bus lines and parks. We did not move to have people in a three story building looking into our backyard and disrupt our privacy lower our property values and disrupt our lives, which we have closely guarded for the last 25 years. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Robert Zeckenmeyer. I go by Zach Zeckenmeyer. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm, barely. If you could tip the microphone down. Okay. I'm retired, living at 2732 Tandy Turn with my wife for 25 years. Close, the closest we are, I think we're the closest to the Benson property. We're on the nor north side and partially onto the west side my concerns are four things it's the traffic on Coburg Road and Tandy Turn right now the Benson engineer used old city counts no new counts were made made some general counting of how many cars can wait at a stop sign so they can get out of their property we need more information on the corner 
of Coburg Road and Tandy Turn. Next one I have is privacy. I don't want to, just like my wife stated, I do, I do not want a three-story within five feet of my property line looking down onto our yard and home. Is that privacy? No. Okay, we'll go to value, property values. Our values will go down. Our neighborhood will go down. Our good neighbors are selling and moving. You did not let them talk very long. History. The property is very poorly maintained and is this the way the new apartments will go? This is one major concern. I'm going back to the hearings officer who stated right off the bat he was not going to go see the property at all. And is this the American way of moving old people out of the neighborhood? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I don't have any other green slips. So now um, I would ask for staff response or follow-up. At this time, we, we have nothing further. Okay. And then now the applicant's rebuttal or follow-up. Chair Randall and Planning Commission, good evening. Mike Reeder, 800 Willamette Street, Suite 800. Rebuttal for the applicant. I just have a couple of uh, items that I want to, to rebut. Um, pr particularly, Ms. Richter spoke to the Willikensee area refinement plan policies. This is ground that has been covered in the 1,900 pages that are in the record. Um, it's, been at, it's, been asked, uh, yeah. it's been asked and answered. Specifically, there are other plan policies in the Willikinsey Era Plan that I have uh, identified also in the record, and I just turn your attention to Willikinsey Area Plan, page 16, that has other plan policies for residential policies and proposed actions, particularly policy four and five, and also the entire text of policy one, which says maintain the existing low density residential character of existing Willikensee area neighborhoods while recognizing the need to provide housing for all income groups in the city. I would submit that this is not an applicable mandatory uh, approval criteria for this application, but even if it was, the Planning Commission could easily find that uh, weigh and balance that particular plan policy. I don't think it's necessary, but I just wanted to alert you to that, to the entire text of policy one. And then also policy four says, encourage a mixture of housing densities and types to address the housing needs of a diverse population. Number five, encourage medium and high density residential uses in areas which have good access to commercial services, public open space, schools, parks, transit, and other alternative modes of transportation. Now let me take a little a minute just to um, speak uh, to the to the comments that were made, kind of the the, the comments that are made by the neighbors. I, I, as I said early on in this process, I understand the concerns of neighbors when you're talking about doing a zone change from R1 to R2. Land use uh, planning and land use law is complex. It sometimes we get in the weeds, and so the emotions and the desires of real people who invest substantial amounts in their homes is really on the line. And I don't discount that. And I hope that, I hope that the folks here don't think that I discount that. There's another side to the story, which is the owner of the subject property who relied on the Metro Plan designation and at the time, the September 1992 Willikensee Area Plan that showed this as, as, um, as medium density residential. And so as you're weighing those issues, there's, there, there, are, there are human elements on both sides, not just the neighbors, but also the, the subject property owner who is a resident, a longtime resident of Eugene, not some out of state or out of town developer wishing to do this. It is in the record that uh, she has had intentions of eventually someday 
developing this property for medium density residential, as was Mr. Mahalik, which is found in the record. Again, I cite what's in the record. I don't have no. I was. I'm not. I will not pretend to say that I was here in 1992. Uh, Mr. Hansen was. I was not. All I can do is look at the record. All the hearings official could do was look at the record. And what the record tells me is that the Metro Plan has always designated this property medium density residential. If you look at the 1987 blob map, it's clear that the blob map bleeds well over the east side of Coburg Road, including the subject property and also including some of these other properties. Did the 1992 process uh, adopting the WAP whittle that back? Absolutely. There were five properties that were specifically mentioned uh, in the record. This was not one of those properties that was whittled back. And um, specifically, it was it was uh, I was challenged on my review of Ordinance uh, 20319 that um, adopted the 2004 Metro Plan diagram that made this parcel specific. Interestingly enough, Mr. Conte says that. This, that um, my discussion of the legislative history of 19855 and 19856 is really a collateral attack on 19855. But if you use that same logic, his, uh, his attack on ordinance number 20319 that adopted the Metro Plan diagram in a parcel specific way also is a collateral attack. And so, I would, what I would suggest the Planning Commission do is do what I initially recommended, which is to look at the all three ordinances in, uh, as I described, 20319, 8, uh, 19856, and 19855, and read them together. There is ambiguity. My written material talks about that ambiguity that Ms. Richter uh, challenged me on. I encourage you to take a hard look at that. I am very confident that, we, that if the Planning Commission approves this and um, affirms the hearings official, the findings can be drafted, which, are, which will be sustainable at LUBA, and I encourage you to do so. And uh, I, um, that's the end of my rebuttal. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions for Mr. Reeder? I have, I have a question, uh, John Borowski, Planning Commissioner, and just for everybody in the audience and, and Mr. Reader. Uh, I've been a planning commissioner for all of nine days and so I'm not versed on all the all of the technicalities here so if I'm out of out of line I, I apologize for that. Um, in your rebuttal you you made references to the WAPS policy one, four, and five and wanted us to take notice of those. Um, however in in your arguments the or the the other side you know, points to several policies in the WAP, uh, specifically policy four, I believe it is, and in your arguments you say, no, don't look at that, look at other documents, but yet in your rebuttal, you're, you're bringing up these policies and saying, look at that. So I'm, I'm just kind of right. uh, uh, confused on, on what you want me to do. Do you want me to take these policies and use them to make my decision, or do you want me to, to dismiss these policies because other, other things take higher precedence? That's, that's an excellent question. So the, the answer to that, and in, in, in your experience on the Planning Commission, you will find that there are, there are alternative arguments that are made. So the first argument that we made is that the 2004 Metro Plan Diagram and the current Metro Plan Diagram currently identify and designate this property as medium density residential. And that uh, you don't need to go further because the Metro Plan document itself says that if there's an inconsistency with the, will, with the refinement plan, that the Metro Plan controls. That's our number one argument. Okay. okay. Should you decide to, to, to weigh in on the, the Will Kenzie Area Plan policies, I was merely pointing out that there are other policies that you would need to consider. Okay. All right. So Thank I hope that answers that, your question. That clarification. No. Uh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a, no, that's okay. It's a good question. And, and one more note. It, it, this is, and you've probably seen it, it this is covered in, in the record in my May 1st and May 15th letter. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reeder. Thank you. And with that, rebuttal. Yes. I wanted City to just make one comment because um, I wanted to just let you know that I have reviewed the July 9th letter from Mr. Reeder that 
Terry Richter was concerned about, and it does not have new evidence in it. So you're safe if you want so we to are okay close the using that tonight. Yeah. Okay. So with that, oh, we've got Steve. Well, the one thing, one question I had is because we're on a tight schedule, I was wondering if, uh, I mean, in the past when we've had these, we've, we've allowed the record to stay open for some period of time sometimes. Is that correct? That, that is, that is yeah. correct at times. I know we are on a... If, if uh, uh, you know, fo following on past president, precedent, if the applicant would be willing to add seven days more to the, to the time period, then we could leave the record open for a period of time for them to write up their rebuttal or whatever, you know. Uh, uh, in other words, I, leave the record open. I'll, I'll weigh in on that. There, there was not a request that the record be left open. Um, this is not the initial evidentiary hearing. When you have an initial evidentiary hearing, which would have been before the hearings officer, there's a requirement if someone requests it that you have to leave it open for at least seven days. Um, no one's made a request, but you have the authority to do that. I think staff okay. might have. There's a, I guess I'd be curious issue. about staff's input and the fact that we're already at exhibit J, 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 J. Uh, I yes, believe. as I stated in my AIS, you'll see that there's uh, nearly 2,000 pages of official record at this point that's on the, you know, that, that it's evidentiary. Uh, there's plenty for you to review over the next two weeks. Um, but again, as the attorney advised, this is certainly your discretion if you chose to uh, leave that open, but given the tight time frame that we're working under uh, to have a final order within the 120 days, uh, I would recommend against that. That was the other half of my thing, was, was to request the, that the applicant give us an additional seven days. And well, then, and that certainly would, the that applicant would, would have to provide that. Lighten up the, the pressure, which I, you know, I think we'd all be better okay. with. You know. Okay. So are you requesting that we ask the applicant if they would be willing to leave the record open seven more days to extend that time? Or yeah, that what, be, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what yeah. you're requesting. Yeah. It seemed to me that, uh, you know, we have a very tight schedule. Sure. Right. And so I, but I, let me just point out, I just want to remind yeah. you that the record's closed. So the only thing you would be leaving it open for is additional argument because right. you that's have what we've right. had in the past. So. Okay. I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. I think nor, that nor am I. Okay. So with that, then, I will close the public hearing and close the record. And um, I guess at this point now, I would ask if any of the commissioners have questions for staff, uh, if we need any additional information or clarifications based on um, what we've heard tonight or what we've read that staff can respond to at our deliberation. Steve. Yes, I had one question uh, for the our, our city attorney. And speak into the. I had one question for our city attorney. Um, uh, it was an, it was considerable mention of legislative history. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding was, planning commission. We only do uh, approving a, a refinement plan would be an advisory vote. Would that be? It wouldn't be a legislative vote. We're not in a legislative position, which just would be an advisory vote. What? What would be an advisory vote? In or? other words, the approval of the, the WAP. Of Ordinance 199. I think he's asking five. when. Would have made it in the past. The Planning Commission in 1992, I think, is what he's referring to. You are correct. It would have been a recommendation only at that time. Right. Not And not a legislative decision. Uh, so right. yeah. The City Council I just wanted would have made the clear. final decision in that so matter. So I, I understood. So the legislative decision would have been made by the City Council then? And it would be the record that they had in their deliberations that would be. And that record would have included the Planning Commission's minutes and discussion and the evidence that was before them in making their recommendation, which then would have been passed on to the council for their consideration. Right. But the legislative decision was the city council, so. Yeah. yeah I just wanted to make, make, make sure that I understood, so. Okay. John, do you have any questions of staff? Um, not so much question for staff, just a statement to, to the people who came out. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out uh, that did testify. Um, again, I'm, I'm new to this, so we are kind of bound, from what I've learned, we are kind of bound to a very narrow window to look at here, so we're not 
judging the whole thing. We're judging a very little piece of it, and we'll do our best to to you know look at that piece and see what's what the record shows and and how we weighed out out on it. But thank you all for coming out. Jeff, I guess I'd like to uh, ask staff to uh, make an effort where they can to shed whatever light they can on the uh, history of Lot 101 and whatever MDR, LDR designation, when it may or may not have changed. And under w and what were the circumstances? I'd like to have a timeline, if I could, on that, so I can understand what's going on and why something changed or didn't change. It, where you can do that, that'll be a very big help for me to figure out where we are. Understood. Okay. And then I also have a question regarding sub-assignment error 1B as relates to the site review overlay. Um, I know that was in the initial uh, proposal or at least staff's initial thought and the hearings official discounted that. And I'd be curious maybe to get a little more information on um, on that aspect of Certainly, of we'll this. address that at the yeah. deliberations. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions of staff? Okay. Um, the Planning Commission will reconvene to deliberate on this issue Monday, July 22nd at 11 a.m., 11.30 a.m., actually. And uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you for coming.